This conference will now be recorded. Hello, everybody. I'm Joe Kenner with Intermountain Sales and Marketing. Glad to be able to host this uh, training today for you uh, on Oilers. Uh, Intermountain Sales and Marketing has been a longtime supporter of the association, and uh, we're proud and, and happy to do that. We appreciate the uh, support that uh, the members give us. And I uh, just want to tell you a little bit about ourselves before we get into our training today. Um, our address here is in Woods Cross at 965 West 850 South. And uh, I just wanted to, rather than try to go through our line card, I wanted to just uh, talk about how you can find us at www.entsales.co. And uh, that will give you our line card one that I wanted to give you in terms of that was uh, a lot of people when they're looking for pump sizing and pump curbs and so forth have a hard time finding that stuff on Grunfoss's website which is one of the lines that we represent and so our uh, tech guru here in our office Aaron has uh, put all that stuff on our website so if you go to itsales.co and click on products It'll pull and then go to Grunfoss. You can find all those uh, cut sheets and pump curves and so forth there that make it just so much easier for you to find that stuff. So that's just one hint. If you have a tech support question on, on boilers or anything, we have a special tech support phone number that uh, will, will get us into our tech support guys 801 936 And uh, that's a, a great resource. So we wanted to uh, let you know about those things, and uh, we'll turn the time over to James for our training for the day. James Frady. All right. Thank you, Joe. Welcome, guys, to our training. Uh, today we're going to be going over our uh, gas pressure testing and our uh, combustion analyze training on the boilers today. So a couple of things that we're going to go over uh, with the training. So first of all, on your gas pressure testing, um, download your app, The Good Practices, on your mobile device. That app gives you your gas pipe sizing, your pressure charts, uh, all of that good fun stuff for, for your boilers, because uh, the gas company no longer offers the, the book yellow book that we've been used to over the last few years, so quite a few years. Um, so download that app and get that on your mobile device. Um, so gas pressure, we also call it, we refer to it as our water column testing, our pressure testing. Um, gas pressure is, is pretty small, uh, it's hard to test if you actually do gas pressure, so it's been converted into easier format to uh, test with, and it's called water column. Um, our boilers, in natural gas settings, you're testing between 4 and 14 inches of water column for your boiler. Uh, if you're in LP, you're going to be between 8 inches and 14 inches of, of gas pressure to test your boilers. One rule of thumb that we like to point out is if you're putting the regulator pretty close to the unit if it's in your mechanical room, try and make sure you have at least 10 feet of pipe length so that includes your 90s and, and your fittings and stuff, but try and keep about 10 linear feet of pipe between your regulator and your boiler. Uh, it just helps with the, the boiler to run properly and, and not walk out in uh, low, low gas pressure. So, so why do we test for, for water column? Okay? What, is, what is water column? Uh, basic, again, it's just testing gas pressure because our gas pressure is always a, a very small number. So uh, your water column, one inch of water column on our meters is about only 0 0.036 PSI of gas pressure. So instead of trying to measure something in these low pressure settings, it's just a lot easier on this inches of water column. Okay. So we use a manometer, right? There are various different types of manometers we'll show you here in a minute. Um, kind of the most common design was the U-shaped fluid filled manometer. Uh, it's a pressure device that uh, one side is connected to your appliance, the other side is just atmospheric vented. And as you turn on your gas appliance, you get the gas to that appliance. 
be obviously the level is going to drop on that side and push it up on the upper opposite side. So in order to test for that, again you connect one side to your your appliance. The other side is open to atmospheric. Okay? As you apply that gas pressure on into your appliance, you're going to get the difference between your levels. So you're going to measure between your lowest point and your highest point, which with this example gives us our seven inches of water column in this in this example. And so this appliance here, according to our numbers, if we were natural gas, we are okay on our pressures. We are well within that four to 14 inches of water column. If we were LP, then we need to turn up our gas pressure because we're too low, according to this manometer. Uh, a couple pictures on the sides here uh, are just different style manometers you can buy. There's various styles, types. Um, you can get them in a digital format. You can get them in just a water tube type format. So you fill it with water, you connect your gas pressure up on the, the, the little nipple sticking out the top of it. Pressure will rise and tell you which water column is that way. Uh, they are also available in a gauge format. Uh, we just like to tell everybody if you're in a gauge format, be careful because gauges always break and uh, always go out. So just gauges are hard to deal with because guys like to just throw stuff around. So be careful with those. But even the digital ones nowadays, uh, sometimes they have to be recalibrated depending on which manufacturer, what brand they are. So sometimes you have to recalibrate them or you have to set them back to zero so you know what your gas pressures are. Um, so on your gas valves, when you're looking at a boiler, this is the front view of a, of a wall hung boiler here. Um, as we find the gas valve in the boiler, okay, now we need to know where we test, find our test port for that gas valve. Uh, this particular gas valve here and pretty much all gas valves that are residential wise, you can find your gas test port on the first incoming nipple of where your gas supply comes into your, your gas valve. Okay. On your commercial side of your gas valves, there generally there's a, either a little bung or a little plug that's going to be on a ball valve coming into the gas valve. It won't be on the gas valve on your commercial side. Either. So, if that's the case, then you have to remove that, that bung or that plug. You replace it with the, the little brass nipple that comes in your drum or kit, so you can hook up your hose. Um, when you go to do your gas test uh, on your boiler, um, first thing to do obviously is turn the gas off to the appliance, so you don't uh, you don't leak gas into the room and into the building. So you're going to shut the gas off. You're going to go to your gas valve, you're going to find it, you're going to find where your gas test port is. All of your boiler manuals are going to tell you where the gas test port is. They're going to tell you where the throttle screw is on your boiler for your adjustments and all that stuff. So make sure you refer to your manuals uh, for your particular boiler to find out which, uh, which port is the one you're supposed to go on. Most of the gas valves, especially residential, are going to have multiple ports on them for testing. Um, generally, you don't use more than one of them. It's only during extreme troubleshooting on these gas valves that you're using the other type of, uh, of, of test ports and nipples on the gas valve. So, um, so this one's the, the inlet to the gas valve. The other one you can see in the picture here is the outlet side of the gas valve going to the appliance. And, um, because of the function of the gas valve, the way they're designed and how they function, your pressures are going to be a lot different on the outlet side of the gas valve than on the inlet. Even though you have your seven inches of water column coming into the gas valve, that's not necessarily how much it's going to be using when it's running. So that, that pressure varies as the boiler is running at certain uh, percentages. Uh, again, in your installation operation manuals, every boiler uh, is has its specifics. Uh, each boiler will talk about how to do the adjustments. Um, this particular setup here is talking about your LP conversion kits for your boilers. Uh, all boilers can be ordered from the factory LP if you want. Uh, most applications for our area here, we order all natural gas and then we convert in the field as needed. So if you are converting to natural gas, from natural gas to LP, make sure you follow the instructions in the conversion kit to properly convert that boiler over. 
Um, and then obviously if we convert a boiler from natural gas to LP, there's adjustments that are going to be need, need, need to be made for that gas valve so that boiler will run properly. Um, as you can see on these pictures here, um, these boilers, they, they take multiple pieces for that LP kit to work. Um, some boilers take one piece, uh, just to the orifice kit for the boiler. So make sure you refer to your manual, make sure you're, you're paying attention to what your specific boiler needs uh, for the application that you're doing. Um, okay, so as we come into our gas pressure testing, so we've tested the boiler and uh, we found that our gas supply pressure is adequate and that we are we're okay for the boiler to be ran and to be set up. In some instances though, uh, some experience that we've had, we've been on job sites where uh, the contractor has installed an improper gas size on, on the boiler. Um, a lot of times the, the contractor will go off of the size of connection that the boiler offers. Um, and that's not the right way to go because we don't know what the length of pipe is from our gas meter to our appliance. Uh, other applications that are in line with the, the boiler, uh, if there's furnaces, there's water heaters, um, other accessories that are in line. So we need to make sure that we're referring back to that app at first, that good practices app. Um, off of our charts, we're sizing our gas lines accordingly for our incoming pressures and that we're, we're running the right size line to the boiler. Uh, a couple examples that we've had recently, uh, we've had a couple boilers that were getting locked out in low gas pressure. But when they tested the, the gas pressure on the boiler, with it just being in standby, not, not running, we had 11 inches of water pump, which was very adequate. But what was happening on this 725,000 BTU boiler, when it would fire, at full fire, it would suck the gas line dry, and it would go under that four inches of water column and then trip the gas switch and the boiler would lock out and then wait until somebody came and reset it. Um, what we ended up finding is they put too small a gas line uh, off of the regulator down to the boiler. Um, so the fix of it obviously was we had to go back, size it for the BTUs, size it for the length and everything that was in size in series with the gas system and we ended up and making it from a one inch gas line up to a two inch gas line to make it adequate for, for the boiler to be able to run right on full fire. Um, all of your boiler manufacturers, your installation manual are going to tell you uh, that on your gas pressure testing, when you are testing, you do want no more than one inch of water column drop between static, not running, and dynamic gas pressures uh, when you are running. Uh, some manufacturers are okay with about a two inch uh, water column drop. So again, refer back to your installation manual to the factory uh, and all sorts of local codes when we need that. In that instance, James, would it have been an option to have gone two pound gas to the first appliance or all the appliances and then put regs on those appliances? And right. Yeah. We've had some instances where uh, the boiler was an afterthought, and so the house was, was plumbed in smaller pipe and was a low pressure system coming into the house. But then they added a boiler and ended up needing extra volume. And so, yeah, they had to, they had to change the gas company, or they had to have the gas company come and change the main rig to a higher pressure. And then they had to add regulators throughout the house on the appliances just so they could make the, the piping in the house that was there work. Does that have other complications to, to that for venting or any of those gas regs or anything like that? Uh, residential applications, usually not. Uh, commercial applications, you do have to do venting. Uh, you have to have regulators that are atmospheric vented. So it adds a lot more cost. It adds a lot more plumbing to add into the system. So there's a lot more that way. So the cause of for your gas pressure to drop Two, two uh, inches or more, is that tend to be a piping issue? Generally, that is undersized gas piping for, for how many BTUs you are using. Um, we've, generally, that seems to be the biggest problem, is just guys undersizing the gas piping, because they, 
They don't necessarily refer very often to their user manual. For the installation manual, they just look at the size of the pipe connection to the boiler and they go off of that. Um, and that's always an issue. Going into the gas regulator, it's always a smaller connection than, than what your gas pipe needs to be BTU wise. So, uh, a nice analogy that we like to use is your McDonald's straw versus your coffee straw. Right? And McDonald's straw is a lot easier to, to either get fluid through or to blow through versus your little tiny stir straw for your, your hot chocolate or your coffee. Right? So, it's just kind of the same analogy for the gas. If it can't suck it through, it'll lock out because there's no pressure there. Anything else on gas pressure? Questions on that side? Okay. So now that we verified our pressures are good for our gas, our, our water column is there and available, now we're going to move into our combustion testing. Um, this is something that I think is coming more common. I think a lot more people are starting to actually do combustion analyzing and the combustion testing on their boilers, their equipment, furnaces or what and such. Uh, and there's good reasons why. Uh, one, it's a safety factor for not only us as contractors, but it's a safety factor for our, our homeowners or for our building uh, commercial jobs that we're installing this equipment in, right? Okay. So why do we do a combustion test? What is the purpose of doing combustion analyzing, okay? And what does this have to do with the boiler? Why does the boiler need to have this? And, well, first of all, the manufacturer of the boiler comes out and they tell us that these, this equipment is supposed to be more energy efficient than it was 30 some odd years ago. Okay? And they're supposed to be in that 90% range of efficiency. So in order to do that, there's some maintenance required in order to do that. Okay? Just like our cars, in order to keep our cars maintenance and, and going, okay? we got our tire pressures, we got our oil changes, we got our fuel, we got keeping it clean, air, air filters, all this stuff. Okay? All of that is kind of the same concept when we come to our boilers. Okay? There's maintenance that's required. And a lot of that maintenance is right up front when you first install it. So the information that our combustion analyzer provides us is uh, to keep both you and your customer out of trouble down the road. And so we don't want issues with, with ourselves, with our, our installs. We don't want anything to happen with our customers. And why is that? Because we have something that burns. We have something that burns gas. It causes an odorless, a tasteless, a colorless uh, substance that's not very good for us. Okay. And so in the combustion process of our boiler, it's a high concentration of products that often is undesirable that comes out of that boiler. Okay. So we get carbon monoxide, we get soot, the nitrogen oxides, the sulfur, okay. we get all of this bad stuff up in that uncontrolled combustion. So if we're not setting our boiler up to be the most efficient, then all of this stuff increases and can cause, cause us harm. What we're trying to do with our boilers, like we just talked about, is get our best thermal efficiency out of this product, right? And the factory has shipped it and told us that, hey, it's supposed to be a 96% efficient product. Okay? Well, that is true from the factory because it's a controlled environment and they can set their their systems up to do so. But then the boiler gets shipped out across the country, across the world, and those conditions are going to change very, very easily, right? Okay, so we're going to put our air and our fuel into that unit, but then we have all of our losses, okay, our losses on our flue gas through our, our, uh, through our flues. We've got moisture in our fuel, moisture in the air. Okay, if you're a humidity uh, area, okay, your boiler is going to burn a lot different than it does here in Utah where we don't have much humidity and we're a lot drier. Okay, you've got a number of gases going through and then you've got the losses of the heat just through the material of the product, okay? the material of your venting. You lose all of that heat so we're losing some efficiency that way. Okay? So in this case the, the radiant heat is transferred into, is to transfer a burnt fuel into heated water to steam or into air and that transfer is then sent into our, our space, get okay, our physical space for comfort through domestic hot water, through snow melt, through various needs. Right? And so what we're ultimately trying to do when we're doing this is get our best, most efficiency possible out of that way. And there are quite a few different ways that we can do that. First of all, we need to know what is going to affect 
this combustion process. A lot of things that go into come in, in affecting how this unit's going to run. Okay, like we've talked about already, our natural gas and our LP. Okay? We all know that LP burns completely different. And if we remember the chart back that says what our pressures have to be, the air pressures need to be higher on LP than they do on natural gas because of the burning process. Our gas pipe size, we've talked about that one too. If our gas pipe size is, is undersized, is not sized properly, our unit doesn't run. Or it's going to lock out because it can't run because it doesn't have the pressure there to run. Right? Is our gas line purged? Did we ever purge it? I've had guys call up and they say the boiler won't run. After finding out, they just barely hooked it up and just barely turned everything on while well, they never purged the gas line, so the boiler would not fire. But sometimes with LP, you get moisture in our LP systems. So with that moisture, boilers well, don't run properly, and sometimes they don't fire. Okay, we've talked about our gas pressure and our pressure drop. And that kind of goes in hand in hand with our pipe sizing and our length of pipes, and et cetera. Okay, flu size and our length of flu. Again, the INO manual gives us our flu size and our flu length that is for particular to each boiler. Uh, each boiler has a certain size and has a certain length that it can run for intake and for exhaust. Okay. What we've noticed uh, on some of our flu sizes that installers have done is they'll go sidewall for their intake and then they'll go through the roof for the exhaust, which is not an uncommon practice, it's a good practice. But what we're finding is they're only doing five to 10 feet on the intake, but then they're running 50, 60, 100 feet on the exhaust. And what that causes is a differential <coughs> in those pressures of that, that intake and that flu, and it causes the boiler to run different. Um, it's hard for the boiler to run sometimes that way. So we got to be very careful on how, how we run our flus. Uh, we've had some guys that do remodels, and they'll change a the boiler out. And they change a the boiler that 20, 30 years ago could be piped on a 6 inch pipe. And now they've changed it to something new. Well, the new boiler needs to be piped on an 8 inch pipe. Well, they throw reducers on it and they just put it in and call it good. They end up finding out that the boiler doesn't draft right, it doesn't vent properly, and then it ends up not running right. Okay. And then you get a you get a mad upset customer because they paid all this money for a boiler don't work. So we gotta be very careful with what we do. How close distance wise if you're gonna you know, run combustion air on the top and then run your fresh air out sidewall, is it if you can keep them within the 20% range of difference, generally you're usually okay. Um, the ones that we've noticed is it's, it's a significant difference in, in pipe length. With the amount of 90s and their 45s and all of that is you know, it's just a huge difference. And the, the blowers on the, the boilers don't seem to like that. And this is, we're talking about on, on that, the, the venting that's on your 90% your boiler with either polypropylene or PVC venting boiler. So, um, obviously your 80% boilers are many of these fan assisted or natural traps, right? Um, but even with those, if it's a natu natural draft boiler, right, you've got to have adequate room uh, room air for your, your atmospheric venting. And I've been into somewhere, you know, the, the hole in the door has been undersized. For, for the size of oil. Um, and sometimes if you do a replacement, you put a bigger boiler in and necessarily don't really think that you gotta make the, the openings bigger on your, your door or your, your wall intakes, right? So then we end up having, having issues that way. Another one that uh, is coming out a little bit more, guys are starting to pay more attention to it, is our water quality. Okay. Sometimes we think, well, that's inside the boiler. That doesn't have anything to do with the, the burning process of the boiler. Okay. And technically, it doesn't have too much to do with the burning process, but it has a lot to do with our transferring of that burning process into the water that we're trying to heat. Okay. And if our water quality is, is gunked up, if there's too much uh, sediments, there's too much calcium, if there's a lot of buildup in that heat exchanger, then we're not transferring that heat into our heat exchanger into our water to get that out to our space we're trying to heat. Okay? So water quality has an effect on how that boiler works. Our air quality, okay? a lot of 
just funny stories that we always tell each other as contractors as the general came up because it's 15 degrees outside a day and he wants the boiler on and they're sheetrocking tomorrow. Okay. It's a common thing that most guys, contractors, always ask for, which you can get because you need hot water and not you need heat in order to, to do sheetrock and mud and tape. But the problem with that sheetrock dust is it goes everywhere and anywhere and takes out everything. So we found that uh, if you're running your boilers with bad air quality, it goes right into that burner chamber, plugs up your burner, plugs up your boiler, and, and you have all sorts of problems and issues and you change your parts. So be very careful with your air quality. If you're in a windy, dusty area, then you got to make sure that your terminations for your flue are in a spot where you're not really going to suck up a whole lot of dust. You're not going to take in all of those, those contaminants. Um, all of your your boilers should either have a boiler cap, if you're the 80% type boiler, and you're going out through the roof, make sure there's that boiler cap, that rain cap with the bird screens. And if you've got the PVC or the polypropylene bending, same thing, make sure there's the bird screens on it. Okay, I've been to a couple boiler jobs in Park City, you open up the boiler to do a service on it, and it's full of board, uh, dead birds. Okay. So they didn't have, once we got on the roof and found out, it's just open pipe. So birds got in and found it was nice and warm and got sucked down through. So, um, okay, our boiler location. Um, that one uh, it doesn't affect as well. If you're down in sea level versus up here in Utah, okay, some of our locations in Utah we can get up almost upwards of 10,000 feet. And the boiler is going to run a lot different at sea level than it will at 10,000 feet. And so, Again, there's there's things to compensate for that. There, the manufacturers, boiler manufacturers, they make their boilers where they can be rated for sea level, they can be rated for high altitude and high, high altitude. So when you're ordering your boiler, you're getting ready to go install it, make sure you tell the factory or whoever is ordering the boiler um, what your altitude is so they, they can be ready for that. Okay. And then we talk about our boiler efficiency. Right? An 80% boiler, Okay, they're, they're not as hard, but they take a lot of time to set up on an old 80% boiler. Because okay? you have to really get into that heat exchanger, you have to tear that heat exchanger apart to change orifices, to change burners, to change that kind of stuff. So it's kind of a little bit more labor intensive to do those ones versus the new 90% boilers. 90% boilers don't take as much that way, other than they just take time with the convection analyzer in order to sit there and set them up and adjust the gas valves properly. Okay. And then we talked about your, your heat exchanger condition. And we've got some, we've got some uh, pictures here that we'll show with that. Okay. We talked about all of these different pieces here that affect our combustion. So if our heat exchanger is dirty, and if it's been in for a couple of years and has never been touched or serviced, okay, then it's more likely that our numbers on our combustion analyzer are going to be off. And we're going to have some issues. So there's some things to think about as we're getting ready to do this, this anal analyzing. Um, all of our boiler manufacturers, they're going to give you charts in their books. They're going to tell you where that boiler should be set at and what we need for that boiler. Okay? There's startup sheets that come with the boilers as well. That startup sheet's going to ask you questions. What are your numbers on your, your combustion readings? Okay? Uh, on the combustion, we're looking for three different things. We're looking for our CO2, our O2, and we're looking for our CO parts per million. So there's three different things that we're really, really focused on looking at. Okay. And again, you can see here, natural gas versus propane. They're a little bit different numbers, okay, because we burn differently. Okay. And some of these charts, you can see this guy, he looks a little different than the chart over here. Okay. These four other manufacturers are a little bit different how they display their settings and what they ask for. Um, but every boiler manufacturer has their service manual that talks about how to do the adjustment, where to go to do the adjustment on the boiler, um, and then the numbers and the ranges that you're looking for. So these are just some examples that we've, we've had from some boilers. So we talked about the quality of the heat exchanger. So this is looking inside two different boilers. Okay? This one here, this is a water tube boiler. And you can see all these little, we call them coffee grounds. You know, these little, they're kind of hard, but if you start rubbing them together, they, they break down into a powder. 
But the problem with this process is, is your burner sits right here in front. Okay? So your air comes in, goes through the burner. Well, all of those flue gases now have to go in between all of these ridges and go through that, that uh, heat exchanger and then back out through the, the flue. So when you get all of this type of buildup, you're no longer getting your flue to bypass all of that and go through those chambers. Okay? These chambers that you're seeing here, those are all full of water. That's where your water transfer, your heat transfer happens is right there. So if you have all of this buildup, you have that blockage, that's where you're not transferring that heat. So then you're just taking that heat and it's gonna go where it can. It's gonna create all these excessive heat spots on that heat exchanger but then you're going to lose a lot of your efficiency because it's just going to go right back down through the fluid. Okay. And same thing with this style of boiler over here. This is looking down. This is on a fire tube heat exchanger. So all of these little slots you can see here, that's where the, the flue gas has to go down through. And then surrounding this burner chamber here is where your water is. So it comes from the bottom, surrounds that boiler, and then goes back out the side here. Again, if we're plugging up all of those little ports where the flue gas has got to go, one, we're not getting heat through those chambers anymore. Two, we're just going to be pushing all of our, our gases, our flue gases, down through that chamber and out through the boiler, and we're not transferring our heat. Talk about our water quality. Okay, um, I don't know how many of us have pulled a pump out and it's looked like that before. Okay. I don't know how many times we've got pumps back that have looked like that before. Okay. But your scale buildup, okay? You got lime scale, you got calcium, um, you got magtite, you got all these different materials that we have because of these different metals. Okay? We're mixing stainless, we're mixing cast iron, we're mixing uh, copper and brass and all of these different metals. And those metals are going to react to each other and they don't like each other. And then you go up to Park City and you fill it with water that's not necessarily the best water. Okay? Park City used to be a mining town and there's a lot of minerals in the water in our area. Um, we have very hard water all throughout Utah. Um, that hard water it creates havoc on these systems that are considered a closed loop system and recirculate the same water over and over and over. So if we're not coming in annually and testing our boilers and our water systems and cleaning them, this is what happens. We get a call from our, our contractor, we get a call from our homeowner and says, my boiler's not working anymore. And once you start looking at it, you're starting to find, well, I got some problems going on. Well, unfortunately, these problems that it shows in these pictures were non-warranty problems because it was something that in the installation manual tells you that there's stuff that you need to be checking and watching and monitoring all the time. And so, this is the water tube heat exchanger here. You can see about half of that tube is plugged up with buildup and sediment. So you can see that our water quality is affecting the heat exchanger because we're not transferring the heat at the hottest part of this heat exchanger. And so the failure due to this heat exchanger was because we were cold, we weren't transferring the heat, it overheated and started distorting the metal and then took the metal out ruined the heat exchanger, the exchange started leaking, and there goes the oil. Okay. Same thing happens with this heat exchanger here. All of that calcium and all of those minerals, that lime sticks to where the hottest part of that burner is. Okay. That's where it wants to go. It gets attracted to that. And so what happens here is as it gets built up, it gets attracted to that. That's your hardest portion on that heat exchanger. That's where most of your heat transfer is going to happen because that's where your water touches that burner first. But now it can't do it, so it's trying to find other ways to collect that heat. But it can't do it, but the metal can only take so much stress and so much heat before it's time to give up and just let go. Okay. So these two here, you can kind of see that a lot of rust build up on that pump there. Okay. This one probably came out of a cast iron pump. Cast iron and, and bad water, they don't like each other. And so all of that goes in and it starts doing all of this. Okay. So if we maintain our heat exchangers, we have a brand new heat exchanger, that's what they look like. Okay. And if we can maintain our heat exchangers to keep like this, to stay this way, as long as we follow the, the suggested procedures that our, our boiler manufacturer asks us to do. 
So you can see here, this is the water tube heat exchanger. There's our burner. Our air intake comes up through here, goes through the burner. That's where your gas mixture happens, is right in there. As you come through the gas valve, gas valve sits right now. And then all of these tubes are full of water. Okay? So your incoming water starts on the back side of the boiler, works its way up, gets hottest, and then goes back out through the heat exchanger into the system. So you can see all those flue gases, they have to come in between those heat exchangers and go to the back of the boiler and then out through the venting. So if you get all that buildup in there, then it stops all that and doesn't work. And then again, on the, the fire tube style heat exchanger, same thing. All of these little chambers is where your, your flue gases have to go down through the boiler, and then they come back out through the side and go up through the venting. If we're plugging that stuff up, we end up causing havoc on stress on the, the burner assembly. We call we cause stress on the, the heat exchanger assembly itself, and all of those parts eventually will break and go bad. Your venting. We've talked a little bit about venting. If you look in the, the boiler manufacturer's books, they show you various methods of piping and doing your venting. Um, again, re refer to your local codes, refer to your boiler manual on doing your installations because there are uh, tolerances and distances that you have to follow. Um, if there's a door or a window that's on a side wall and that's where you're putting your, your venting out for your appliance, um, there's distances that you have to be away from that door or from that window. So there's a lot of things to consider when you're trying to pipe it. Um, if you're in a windy area, you might want to kind of avoid some of these other piping methods because it creates a lot of havoc um, doing research. But each boiler manufacturer, again, you can see two different ones here. They're similar on how they can pipe them. They have the same methods, same ideas. But if you notice, all of their methods, the boiler piping stays where it's pretty equal in length on, on all types of venting. Okay, so even the sidewall versus going through the roof, okay, just make them pretty close within that 20% is, is generally fine. Well, we'll find them. Uh, another example from just another manufacturer. Okay, same thing. You, they can all be piped the same different methods, the guys like to do them different ways. Uh, one good rule of thumb on your venting, if you're going sidewall on them, do not put it in an alcove, do not put it in a corner. Make sure it's on a pretty open sidewall where there's not going to be much affected. Uh, some examples I've come across, uh, one big house in Park City that we did had huge eaves on it. They were like two foot eaves hanging off of and what we found in the winter time is that condensate would go up and catch in those eaves and started building up icicles and it was ruined and it was all wood and it was ruined in these eaves because it would just build up all that condensate and it was causing a whole bunch of problems. Um, and he had his venting built into the eaves for the attic. So it had that little two inch channel of vent that was in there and so it was going up into the attic as well. So you just gotta be careful because when we installed the boiler, that was the job I actually did when we installed the boiler, none of that eave and those vents were there. And so we didn't think much of it until we found out there was a problem that came up in one time. And unfortunately, the only fix we could do was just extend the, the venting on the outside of the house, and it didn't look too pretty, but we were able to get it to work. So. If I can't breathe, the furnace isn't safe, right? So a couple of pictures or problems in this picture that you can see here. One, there's no bird screen that we can tell. Okay? There's no bird screen in there. Two, it's hard to tell the distance, but they seem pretty close to each other. And your intake is very, very close to the, to the ground. Okay? This obviously looks like a place that gets snow. So if you got something that, that we just had recently, you'll get a lot of buildup in that snow, and that could cover up your intake, and it will shut your appliance down. And you'll be wondering why. Um, I just had somebody the other day that called up and said their furnace wasn't working and they needed somebody to come fix it. Uh, when we got over there, it was batteries of the thermostat died and that's why the furnace wouldn't work. So be kind of cautious of remember that it's the small things to look at first, right? Okay, this example, I love this example. So to separate the two, they put a board in between them. 
Okay? But you can see which one is the exhaust site, right? Okay? Whatever type of vegetation may have been there is no longer there because that fluid is just killing it. Okay? So, good rule of thumb on uh, your sidewall, extend the exhaust, make it straight out. Just a coupling and a verge screen. Let it go straight out and get it out away from the, the, the house. The intake always comes and gets 90 down away from the intake. But again, it's a snow area, so you got to make sure that your tolerances, your heights, are proper so you don't get snow, <coughs> you don't get moisture. No bird strains again, so minus critters, birds, whatever, they're going to come up in the, in the winter time. They're going to want to go huddle right around that and go climb inside. Uh, this was another example of boiler I went to. Uh, this one's up in Heber City. Right? It's been installed for, I think it was about three or four years. The boiler was having problems. We go up, start trying to figure out what's going on with the boiler. Replace the fan, replace the gas valve, and the intake of the boiler because they were all rotted out. Okay? Well, if that's the case, we're our flu. So we go out and find the flu. It's underneath the deck. Surprisingly, the deck was not messed up though from the condensate and it's been a couple of years and usually condensate and wood and ice don't mix very well right? but this application it whatever stained this and clear coated it they put something that was pretty good on there just it didn't, didn't ruin it so to fix this one the only way they could do it they had to take this cover off they had to extend those pipes all the way out through the, the port uh, through that porch there the problem is is now you're exposed to venting Okay, and with a 90% boiler, you have condensation. Condensation in zero degrees temperature, you can freeze. So they had to wrap it with heat tape, they had to insulate it, and they had to try and figure out how to cover it. So obviously, it's not going to be the best looking the exhaust venting going out through the, the ports there, right? Okay. But with that, changing the parts on the boiler, cleaning the boiler, servicing it, doing a new combustion test on the boiler, and the boiler's running. It works great now. Startup checklist. Each boiler comes with a startup checklist. Okay. Uh, there's a couple reasons why. Most boilers will, uh, when they leave the factory, they're going to be started from the factory and they'll be tested from the factory. So all of these numbers here are going to be written down from the factory. Okay. The factory asks you that, hey, you as a contractor, when you install that boiler, do a test on it. Set that boiler up, write your numbers down. Get, it, uh, get that figured out, and then send the sheet back to the factory. The factory with that model and serial number that I asked you for, they're going to put that in their records, and they're going to have it with them. So if something goes wrong, they'll pull it up when you call tech support. They'll pull up their factory record. They'll pull up the startup sheet that you did on the job site, and then that gives them a pretty okay idea of where they're going to be going for some service and for some, some tech support to figure out what's wrong with that boiler. Okay. It's also a good indication for you as a contractor. If you walk up to a job site that you've never been at before and they have a startup sheet sitting with the books that were left with the homeowner, well, guess what? You have a very good reference to go off of to see what the condition of that boiler is. So as you start up that boiler, you get your analyzer on there and your analyzer says that those numbers are pretty, pretty close to the same numbers. And chances are you don't need to really clean that boiler take it all the way apart to service it. You just need to check it, uh, make sure no leaks, check your water quality, okay? Just kind of do a little quick uh, assessment on the boiler, tell the homeowner they're good to go, and come back in six months to a year, okay? depending on the runtime of that boiler. So, good thing to have. Um, so, vice versa, if you have a boiler that doesn't have, they maybe didn't do a combustion analysis when they started it, and it's five, seven years down the road, and it's not working right, um, and you you don't have anything to work off of. It's a, it's a kind of a hard thing to take a lot more figure time out to what's going on with it. Can you know, have a base? Of right. Yeah. If you so the numbers we saw in the chart for our our CO two and our O two and our our parts per million on our CO right. So if you show up to a job site, you've never been there before, there's no literature, there's nothing there. You can get your analyzer on the boiler, you can get it set up, get the boiler running, and get your numbers pulled up. Okay, you're going to get the service manual for the boiler, and you're going to check the numbers that it gives you. 
And if your combustion analyzer is telling you you're pretty close to what those numbers are, it's a pretty good chance that that boiler is running very good. If the numbers are way off, they're out of whack, then you're pulling the, the heat exchanger bar in the boiler and you're starting to clean it, you're starting to test water, you're starting to, to make sure that, that there's nothing else wrong. You check the venting, you check, um, check your gas piping, right? You're going back off, going back over all of the stuff that we just talked about make sure that, that that application is where it's supposed to be. If it's a system that you're familiar with and you have all these charts and you show up and get your analyzer and you're still within your range of where you set it the last time, okay, you're good to go. You just check the simple stuff, make sure there's no leaks, make sure the pressure's still up, and walk away and tell the homeowner I'll be back in six months to a year to check it. So, so doing a combustion analyzer helps out quite a bit to let us know where that application is running, where the status of it is, how, how dirty or how, how clean it is inside. So, uh, again, like Joe said at the beginning of the class, we have that tech support number refers you to all of the uh, manufacturers we deal with, to get you right to their technical support. Um, you can always get a hold of us via the, the phone numbers here uh, or through this uh, email address. We'd love to, to help everybody out. We've got a good tech team here and Intermountain Sales and Marketing, and our website is constantly updated with lots of information for contractors and installers. So, refer you to that. We appreciate the time. Dave? Thank you very much, James. We appreciate Intermountain Sales and Marketing sponsoring this uh, training today. And, Joe, thank you for letting us use your conference room. And, James, you did an excellent job. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We appreciate it. Thank <laughs> you.